we are going to get started. And um, I want to just start by thanking, of course, Darien Library um, for all of their help and work, as well as our co-sponsor, um, uh, YWCA Darian Norwalk. Uh, we also want to thank the administrators and educators joining us today. Um, in particular, I know Shirley Klein, Assistant Superintendent for Special Education and Student Services, as well as I know we had department chairs and psychologists who RSVP'd. So thank you so much for your important work and taking the time out to join us. Um, today's, we are recording today's presentation, so you, we will be sending out that link. Um, it will be about 40 minutes of presentation and 20 minutes of Q&A. Um, you know, we do ask that you um, don't ask any specific questions, you know, children's names or teachers' names, obviously, in um, your questions. And Kelly Dupont from Dairy Antifa will be handling the questions. Um, now, without any further ado, um, Lauren Howe Williams is an aut autism and inclusion specialist. She is committed to helping schools and educators understand neurodiverse students and building inclusive classrooms. She has an extensive background starting out in New York City Department of Education before working for over a decade to refine and expand the NYU ASD NEST support project. She is the co-author of Everyday Classroom Strategies and Practices for Supporting Children with ASD, co-editor of the ASD NEST model. She is part of the NYU Connections Program for graduate and undergraduate students, as well as the director of programs at Pine, the program for inclusion and neurodiversity education. I hope I got all that in, Lauren. Wow. Welcome, we are happy to have you. Oh, thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate uh, that, that, that kind introduction and wonderful welcome. I'm just going to share my screen here so that we can all look at the same thing. Um, thank you for having me uh, and thank you all for joining us today. I know that everyone has a ton going on right now. So the fact that everyone is finding this kind of time to talk about neurodiversity in schools, I really appreciate it. So um, welcome. We're going to be talking today about how to create a culture of belonging. Um, and my hope is that as we're talking today, we can think about each of our roles in this work, right? Whether we are parents, whether we are professionals, um, whether we are administrators, paraprofessionals, and anyone in between, um, what can we do to celebrate the neurodiversity in our schools and to create a culture of belonging? Um, just a quick thank you. Um, I want to make sure that I can recognize the Darian CPAC. Thank you so much for having me, as well as the Darian Library for, for hosting and the YWCA Darian Norwalk. Um, this is a really wonderful group. And I'm I'm I work with a lot of different districts. And to see this kind of partnership in this work across a district is really special. And it's not something that that I see everywhere. So um, thank you all for your work and thank you all for, for letting me a, be a part of this um, community. Uh, just as we as we kind of get started here, I just have a couple of kind of housekeeping and, and grounding things I want to talk about. Um, first of all, I want to um, just give a shout out to the autistic artist whose work is going to be featured in today's presentation. Um, her name is Ina Stankovic. Um, you can also follow her on Instagram at, at Super Spectrum Girl. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about this later in the presentation, but one of the things that is really important to, to me and my work in autism um, and to our work at Pine is centering the experts um, who are autistic. So um, her work is going to be featured in today's presentation, so please make sure to check her out. Also, just a quick note. I want you to make sure to take care of yourself during today's presentation. If you choose to be on camera, off camera, if you need to move, if you need to leave, if you need to come back in, if you need to take a fidget break, whatever it is, please make sure to, to do that unapologetically. Um, this is your space, and so please use it the way, the way you need to in order to access this content and this experience today. Also a quick note on language and a quick disclosure. I wanna disclose that I am neurotypical. I am not autistic. Um, so while I will be talking about autism and neurodiversity today, I myself am not a neurodivergent individual. 
Therefore, I think it's really important that, that I acknowledge that. And for those of us who do work in a space and who are trying to be neurodiverse, uh, neurodiversity allies, um, kind of recognize the space that we take up in the, in the special education world um, and recognize when our expertise is, it needs to be at the center of the work and when sometimes we need to step aside. Um, also a quick note on language. I will be using the language of autistic individual, identity first language in today's presentation. And sometimes that's a little bit new for folks. Um, actually in a lot of graduate school training still, um, educators are taught to use person first language, right? Person with autism, person with dyslexia, things like that. Um, while I'm not going to say that one is right or one is wrong, one of the things that I learned from a lot of my autistic partners who, whom I work with at Pine um, is that they actually prefer to be referred to as autistic individuals. And what, what many of them will say is, my autism is part of me and I don't want it to be separated from me. So please refer to me as an autistic individual. So that's just a quick note on the language that I'm going to be using today um, and why I've, I've selected to use that language in, in my work. Um, just a quick note, we will be doing a Q&A section at the end, so please feel free to drop your questions in the, in the question and answer section, and we'll be monitoring those. We've got a lot of time at the end kind of dedicated for that, so thank you for sharing your questions there. Also, please feel free to reach out to me individually. Um, this is my email, lauren at pineprogram.org. Um, I'm usually pretty good on email, so if you can just give me a couple of days, I will get back to you within the week, so please feel free to reach out there. And then a last note, um, I always like to share whatever it is that I'm currently reading in case anyone's looking for a new resource. If you're not familiar with uh, Geek Club Books Zoom magazine, it is excellent, it is free, it is online. Their current issue is called Black Autistic Lives Matter. It is a wonderful issue that is filled with um, autistic black advocates who are kind of talking about what it is like to live in this intersectional space um, being both black and being autistic. So I highly recommend if you haven't taken a look at this or if you haven't looked at Zoom Magazine um, yet, definitely check it out. Everything is, is free and online. So just a quick note as to who I am and kind of how I got here. And we talked a little bit about this in, in the intro. Um, I work at New York University, and one of the, 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 the ways that I, I showed up initially at, at NYU was talking about how do we create more inclusive experiences for autistic students and other neurodivergent students in public schools. Because one of the things that, that we notice, and, and perhaps some of you have seen this as well, is that all too often students who learn differently are outplaced. Right? Rather than being able to be educated alongside their neurotypical peers in a regular public school setting, um, oftentimes what tends to happen is that they get placed in separate classrooms, in separate schools. They have separate learning experiences. And, and that's something that, that we were really trying to kind of dismantle in, in New York City. So I worked for 15 years with the uh, New York University ASD NEST program. This is a partnership between NYU and the New York City Department of Ed. And what we did is we built an inclusion program specifically designed for autistic students so that they could learn alongside their neurotypical peers in public schools. Um, it's a K-12 program. It's in, I think, almost 80 schools at this point in New York City. Um, and, and what we really realized was many autistic students could be successful in regular New York City public school programs uh, in inclusion classes when educators and related service providers and administrators had the right training to understand how to create inclusive spaces and how to support their academic and social success in the classroom. Um, and this was a really big aha for us. And what I've been really focused on since that work is figuring out how can any public school figure out how to better support their neurodivergent students? Um, because what we're seeing more and more often now is that autistic students are showing up in our general education classes, in our schools, and oftentimes educators don't feel equipped 
they don't feel like they have the right training to understand what they need to do to support that student. And so that's really where we're trying to kind of focus is how do we make sure that everyone understands autism, for example, understands the right support to use in the classroom and understands the importance of creating an inclusive environment, not only for that student, but for all of the students that are in the classroom. So that's really the work that we're, that we're doing at Pine, taking what we've learned works so well in our New York City program and applying it elsewhere. So I've mentioned this, this word a couple of times, and I'm sure for many of you, this is, this is not an unfamiliar term, but what we're really focused on is talking about neurodiversity, right? And neurodiversity is this new layer of, of diversity that oftentimes is left out of some of these, these conversations. Neurodiversity is the idea that the human brain, the human mind is diverse and that this is natural and that this is a valuable um, aspect of our, of our classrooms. You know, we want to find out how can we better understand individuals who identify as neurodivergent? Um, how do we focus on strengths, focus on what students can do, rather than focusing on on more of a, de a deficit-based model, right? Focusing on all of the things that are kind of challenging um, for that individual and for that student. So how do we create school ecosystems that celebrate the inherent neurodiversity of that school? And every school is neurodiverse, every school. And I think even just that simple shift could make a huge difference in how we then support our neurodivergent students who show up in our classrooms. You know, and I, I think that this is, this, is a, this is a small shift for some and a large shift for others. Um, recognizing that by focusing on more of a deficit-based model, we're only looking at what students cannot do rather than focusing on what students can do. And so if we're talking about a neurodivergent student who has an autism diagnosis, for example, rather than focusing on the student has challenges in the area of social communication, the student is having a hard time with, with sensory regulation, how can we shift that conversation and talk about all of the things the student can do in terms of connecting with individual people, in terms of showing a tremendous focus and attention to detail, um, showing a, you know, a deep knowledge of an area of interest. You know, this is, this is that kind of subtle shift that can make such a difference in our classrooms. Um, and when we're talking about neurodiversity and specifically neurodivergent students, um, I'm gonna be talking a lot about autism because that's the, that's the space that, that I work a lot in. But we have to recognize that neurodiversity is not just autistic individuals, right? Neurodivergent students may be dyslexic. Neurodivergent students may have an ADHD classification. Um, neurodivergent students may have um, a mental health issue that they're, they're working through at the time. So this really is a large body of students. And it's something that we need to find a way to put on the radar of everyone in our schools. So if our school communities are increasingly neurodiverse, every school, you know, with one in 59 students classified as autistic. The challenge is most educational professionals don't have the specialized training that they need to support this increasing, this increased neurodiversity in, in their classrooms. Um, and I think this is, this is where we really need to start to do our work. Um, not everyone has to become an autism specialist. And in fact, I think that that model is a little bit broken, right? What tends to happen in schools right now is you have that one magical uh, unicorn special education teacher who has a deep knowledge of or experience in, in autism, for example, or that one really gifted SLP. And then what happens is everyone turns to those individ individual people to say, how do I support this student in my class? Um, while it's wonderful that we have these, these really gifted um, practitioners in our schools, what I'd like to do is give, make sure that every single person in that school building has an understanding of autism, of neurodiversity, of the importance of inclusion. And by raising the level of the ocean, we can create a more equitable, a more, equitable, a more accessible, a more inclusive experience for all students. 
So how do we make sure that every administrator, every teacher, every therapist, every school professional has the tools that they need to better understand and support their neurodiverse school community? You know, that, this is the question that kind of keeps me up at night. This is the question that I, that I hope to, to really work on with schools. And so I wanna to share today just a couple of the recommendations that, that we give to schools and to um, districts on how do you create a more inclusive experience for all of our students, especially focusing on our students who are neurodivergent. So um, we have nine uh, recommendations that we tend to go through. And unfortunately, I'm not gonna have time to go through all nine right now, so I apologize in advance. Um, but I do want to kind of highlight five recommendations in particular. Um, and these are recommendations that I think are, are incredibly relevant for um, school administrators and for um, educational professionals within the school. But I think it's also really important for, for families to consider as well. Um, how might these recommendations impact the work that we do at home? And how can we use these recommendations to build stronger bonds between, between home and school? So for the, for the majority of today's, of today's talk, I really wanna talk through some of these. And I have to tell you, it was very hard to pick which ones we were going to go through. So if you see one that we're not covering, um, and you're a little disappointed, I'm sorry. Um, maybe we'll do, we'll do kind of a part two. Um, but let's jump in with our, our very first recommendation here around neurodiversity in schools. Um, and I mentioned this before, and so I'll just say it again. Um, one of our biggest recommendations is to listen to the true experts, listen to autistic individuals. Um, and I think all too often, especially in, in, in the special education space, the expertise of the autistic community is being overlooked. Um, and all too often, parents, professionals um, in the space look to talking heads like me who are neurotypical professionals as the real experts. And I think that there's a real loss in that because you know, while um, this, is, this will be my life's work, this is something I'm deeply committed to, um, I'm very proud to be uh, an autistic par uh, uh, partner to the autistic community here, um, I don't know what it's like to be autistic. Um, I listen. Um, I think I have a real understanding, right, and of, of what many autistic students experience in schools, but I don't know what it's like to be autistic in a, in a school environment, but there are so many autistic experts that can tell us. Um, they can tell us what it was like for them in school. They can tell us which, what they wish their teachers understood. Um, I have a number of autistic content developers that I work with in, in my program, um, and they're able to speak directly to educators and say, this is what was hard for me. This is what I wish my teachers understood. This is what I wish my teachers would do. And for educational professionals to learn from that expertise is a really wonderful, valuable, and powerful um, opportunity. And I think that all too often when, when neurotypical folks are, are centered in these conversations, we miss things. So, you know, for example, so many of us in the, in the autism uh, profession who are neurotypical did a ton of work with students focusing on eye contact. Right, was constantly doing this, look at me, look at me, look at me, teaching students in the classroom um, in order to show that you are, you are thinking about someone, in order to show that you are listening to someone, you need to look at me. That's a very neurotypical perspective on, on, uh, on attention. When you actually talk to members of the autistic community, you hear again and again and again about their discomfort with eye contact, um, how it actually erodes their ability to pay attention. And I had a student uh, say to me once, I can look at you or I can listen to you. You're going to have to pick. You know, and for, for me, that was a real aha moment. Um, it's painful for many autistic students and autistic adults to, to look people in the eyes. And yet, in our best efforts to, to support the students in the classroom, many neurotypical professionals were kind of pushing for this. So if we listen to the, the community we are trying to serve, we can learn. So whether we're designing a program or even a lesson or just supporting um, an individual child, how can we incorporate the perspectives of, of autistic experts? 
um, for schools that this can be bringing in autistic speakers to um, do professional development in your schools, reading the works of, of autistic authors um, and autistic researchers. You know, this is a this is a small shift that we can make to have a really great impact in building these more inclusive schools um, where we understand the needs of, of our students on a very deep level. So I want to open up with, with that recommendation uh, there as, as our first that we talk about today. The next I want to talk about is we need to find ways in our schools, in our classrooms, in our work to incorporate student interests and passions and fascinations. Um, you know, the, the story I always tell around here uh, is about uh, this happened maybe 10 years ago. I was walking up to a kindergarten classroom. This is in a New York City public school. And on the door, I saw this little sign and it was a picture of Thomas, the, the, the train, with a big X through it, which kind of took me by surprise. And then underneath it, it said, this is a no train classroom. And I wasn't quite sure what to make of that. And so I was trying to figure out, are they, focused on some other type of transportation? Like what, what I don't know, what, what did the train ever do? I'm not, I wasn't quite sure. Um, and when I, when I talked more with the, with the teacher who was lovely and really committed to her work and to her students, she said, well, I have a student in, in my class who's, who's autistic and um, he's obsessed with trains. And so we really need to make sure that we don't bring trains into this classroom. You know, it's really a distraction. He really needs to expand his interests. And so this is a no train classroom. And I mean, my heart just, just broke. Um, this wasn't a teacher who was trying to, to, to make her student unhappy, but um, what she was missing was this student's passion for, for trains and for transportation. This was the thing that he lit up about this was an opportunity for him to connect with other people. This was a, a, a real motivator for him. And she removed that, that light from the classroom in an effort to better support him. And, and I think that a lot of it has to do with, you know, the language that we fall into, especially when we're talking about students with autism. Um, folks will talk about perseverations. Um, these areas of, of restricted interest, repetitive movements, and things like that. I mean, you get it right from the DSM, um, the, Diagnosti the Diagnostic Statistical Manual of uh, Mental Disorders. And I think there's a, there's a loss in that when we're not recognizing the, the inherent um, power of student interests. Because if we can find ways to embrace student interests and to see these as strengths and not as uh, distractions or as things that belong outside of the classroom but should not be incorporated into the classroom. If we can find a way to value these interests, we can use them to help our students make sense of a really confusing world. Um, you know, the, the concept of train stops and moving along train stops is a really great metaphor to help students understand all of the different activities they might do across the morning. Um, they can help our students develop connections with peers. You know, especially when we're talking about students on the autism spectrum, people talk all about how, you know, students have a very hard time connecting with other people. Well, what better, what better thing to use, what better vehicle to use than that student's interest? You know, if you have a student who is really interested in, it doesn't matter what it is, cooking, appliances, Titanic, or trains, there is a way to build a bridge between that student and a peer. You know, they can be used to support academics and instruction. I don't care what interest you kind of bring to the table, there's a way to make a connection to academics. So the, the educators who are saying, well, he's just not motivated just not finding ways to motivate him. Well, if you teach him through the British banking system, which is his current area of interest, you're gonna to have to do some research, but you're gonna be able to find a way to teach through this interest. This is an access point. And then lastly, you know, we're talking today about how do you create a space where students feel like they belong? Well, students with a, with a passion, with a focused area of interest, 
are much more likely to feel like they belong in this space if they see their interests validated and welcomed and respected and not pushed back against. And so finding a way to, first of all, learn our students' interests, um, to recognize them as, as core to, to our students' well-being, and then to figure out what are the smart, thoughtful ways to incorporate these into our classroom. And, and when we do this, we also have to make sure that we don't fall into, into a trap door, right? There is this trap door of teachers saying, okay, great, we're gonna incorporate interests. I'm gonna have my student work for their interests. So I learned this one the hard way because I made this mistake. And then I had a, a student say to me, I, I said, you know, it doesn't feel like you're, you're as interested in, he was really interested in um, Mario Kart. I said, you know, you're not talking about Mario Kart anymore. Are you not into that anymore? And he said, I'm not gonna tell you what I'm interested in because if I tell you, you're gonna take it away and make me work for it. And you know, he was absolutely right because I was thinking that I was doing the right thing. I was thinking that I was incorporating interest into the classroom. What I was really doing was defaulting to using them only as a motivator, right? Only as a reward rather than proactively incorporating my students' interest in a meaningful way into the classroom environment and into the learning. So I think we have to be a little bit careful with this one and make sure that we are authentically incorporating the interest rather than superficially slapping it on as a reward kind of after the student has, has done something that we've asked them to do. So incorporating interests, passions, switching our language, switching our thinking to recognizing the, the real inherent value and importance of these to our classrooms and to creating a culture of belonging for all students. The next recommendation is, is, a, is kind of a tricky one. Um, and it's one that, that requires much longer than, than we have today. So I'm, I'm offering this to kind of get folks thinking, um, but knowing that this requires a, a, lot more, a lot more conversation. And it's the idea of how do we foster authentic social connections for our students. Um, and we need to do this by thinking beyond the traditional social skills approach. You know, one of the things that, that happens in, in schools, especially around um, autistic and otherwise neurodivergent students, is we notice that our students are struggling socially. They're having a hard time developing peer relationships. Um, they're having a hard time reading the unwritten social rules of the classroom. Um, they're finding a hard time connecting. You know, I hear from, from teachers all the time and, and parents who are also concerned, you know, this, this kiddo is just wandering around the periphery of the, of the recess yard. They don't have any friends. And so what we then do is we try to teach the missing social skills. Um, that the student appears to be lacking. And while there, there can be value to that, and that can be a starting place, I think we need to really deepen our understanding of what, of what social is um, and figure out how can we foster really authentic social connections between students um, and not default to teaching the rote social skills that are more observable. Um, how do we, for example, highlight shared interests between two students to help develop that deeper authentic social connection, which can then really drive engagement. Because I think when we, when we don't do this, we run the risk of teaching our students to mask. Um, and this is something that a lot of the uh, autistic experts that I work with, they talk about a, a ton. Um, is they say, you know, I know how to how to make it look like I am doing the right thing socially. I sometimes know the right thing to say, but it's exhausting. It's exhausting to mask. It's exhausting to look people in the eyes because I know neurotypical people need that. It is exhausting. It is exhausting to push away my interests the things that I really want to talk about, to talk about that other thing that the neurotypical community really wants to talk about. Um, and so we need to find ways to ensure that our students aren't just masking, they aren't just learning the more superficial so social skills, and that we're creating a space where 
students can socialize in a way that they are comfortable. Students can connect in a way that they are comfortable. And, and for some students, that might be just sharing the same space as someone else. They may not be talking, they may not be sharing, they may not be doing turn taking, but they are actually occupying the same space together. And, and just that involves a ton of co-regulation, right? These are really foundational um, social development milestones that we wanna make sure that we can see and that we can value um, and that we can then work from to make sure that our students are developing these authentic social connections. Um, and so we really need to ask, what do these meaningful social uh, interactions look like for our students and how can we support them? And I think connected to this, to this idea, a question I get a lot is, well, what do we do with the neurotypical students who are, who are noticing that some of their classmates are presenting very differently? They're engaging in the world very differently. Um, how do we address that? You know, in a way that kind of works and people get really stuck. And I think that the answer actually can be really quite simple and doesn't involve disclosing that student's diagnosis, doesn't involve getting into a big conversation about, about IEPs. I think sometimes it's the, the educators and the adults around the students being comfortable saying, you know what, you are really good at teamwork. You know, I noticed that, you know, you have lots and lots of friends. It's very easy for you to be flexible. You know, you can jump right into a game and figure out what it is that, that you can do to help keep the game going. And, you know, sometimes I know some of that, some of our math facts are a little tricky for you. That's something we've talked about. Well, our classmate over here, you know, you know he's a whiz at his math facts. You know, he does those backwards and forwards. But one of the things I've noticed is it can be a little bit harder for him to be flexible during the game. You know, I know that one of the things that's really important to him is when people follow the rules and he's an expert rule follower. And it's a little trickier for him when people don't follow the rules. And so what we are all doing as a community is recognizing what each of us does that's, that we do really well and what are some of the things that are a little bit trickier for us. And so we as a community, we're going to keep working on your math facts. Anything that we can all do to kind of help you with that, you let us know. You know what? We're going to help him work a little bit on being a little bit more flexible during games sometimes. And so when you go out at recess, you know this is something that's kind of tricky for him. So if he needs help, this is something that's easy for you. You could always step in. You know, so I think these authentic social interactions are, are hard and the work is really nuanced, but I think it is really important if we're going to create a space and, a, and this culture of belonging in our neurodiverse communities, we need to recognize that there's not only one way to be social and to engage socially in the classroom. Next thing I wanna talk about is, is connecting happiness and independence in, in, in school. And this, this is true whether you're talking about a student who is neurodivergent or a student who, who is neurotypical. You know, our ultimate goal is to, is to create happy, independent students, right? And, and, and to figure out how can they move through their days, both experiencing success, but also experiencing it in a way that they feel like they have some ownership over it and they have some choice over it. Um, the goal is not for all of us to, to be independent in the same way or to be successful in the same way. Um, the goal is not to create a whole bunch of neurotypical individuals, right? The goal is to figure out what does each person need to be successful? What does each person need to be independent? For, for, for that person and what brings them happiness. And this is what we need to, to, really, to really anchor in when, when we're talking about supporting some of our students. Um, and I think to, to, to more deeply understand what independence and motivation and happiness kind of looks like, you know, I, I look to the work of, of Ryan and Desi um, who have did a lot of research early on on self-determination theory. Um, and the idea behind self-determination theory is 
is looking at what makes an individual be motivated. And motivation is, a, is something that comes up again and again in classrooms. Um, you know, parents saying, well, he's just not motivated and teachers saying, I just can't get him motivated and administrators hearing from, the, from their staff, you know, they're just not motivated, what do I do? Well, the answer is actually to look what's behind intrinsic motivation. And when we look what's behind, what drives intrinsic motivation, we look at, does the student feel competent in their environment and during a task? So is, the, is the student feeling like they can do what they're being asked to do? Um, does the student feel autonomous, that they have a, a choice in what is being asked? And does the student feel related? related to those around them. If these three things are in place, the student is more likely to be both engaged and motivated. But if any one of these things are not in place, you're going to see a drop in motivation. You're going to see a drop in engagement. So when we see that one of our students is struggling, one of the things that we can do before we make a plan, right, before we get out the laminator, you might still need the laminator, but maybe not. Before we get that stuff out, we need to step back and ask ourselves, does this student feel that they can do what is being asked of them, right? Not can they do it, in our minds. Does the student feel competent? Does the student feel like they have some sort of choice or are they just being told what to do? Like how can we find ways for students to have choice and to have a voice in, in some of the activities that we're asking of them? And last is that relationship piece. You know, we need to make sure that we have uh, good relationships with our students as, as educators and that the students feel connected to their team and to their classmates. If any one of these things is not in place, that's where we begin. That's where we, we really focus. So if our students are not feeling competent, how can we ensure that they feel competent? through differentiation, through um, highlighting their, their successes, things like that. There's lots of work that you can do on any of these three areas, but really stepping back and asking ourselves, you know, what seems to be undermining our students feeling motivated, uh, achieving success, and, and ultimately experiencing happiness in the classroom. And, and we need to think about this uh, from a team perspective, right? This isn't just the work of one special educator. This isn't just the work of one occupational therapist or of one parent. We really do need the interprofessional team talking together about how are we together working on helping our students be more successful, helping to increase our students' independence, and ultimately ensure that they're happy in, in, their, in their environment. And the ultimate goal is to create a culture of belonging. Um, and the research shows that inclusion and inclusive classrooms, inclusive supports, yes, they benefit our students who, who have IEPs and who have a classification, but the research shows that it actually benefits everyone in the classroom. So how do we ensure that we are creating inclusive environments where everyone's needs are understood and everyone's needs are met. Um, and that's going to be a moving target, right? It's not like we're going to do one, two, these three things, and then voila, you have an inclusive classroom, you have an inclusive school. This is going to be constant work, figuring out what is the training that we need? What are the supports that we need? And I think that anchoring all of this work in uh, recognizing the importance of universal design is, is really important, rather than saying, let me make sure that I provide individual supports for each individual student in my class who, who has an IP or who is struggle with, struggling with learning for whatever reason, kind of stepping back and saying, how can I build some of these supports into my lesson planning? How can I build some of these supports into the physical environment that my student is in? Um, how can I make sure that this is just part of how we do things in our class? But that's really the universal design for, for learning approach rather than doing more of the reactive, oh, my student's struggling um, with some of their, with the sensory environment. What can I do? What can I add? What can I change? How can I differentiate after the fact? It's really stepping back and figuring out 
what does my community need? How can I build that into, into the, the classroom, into the school as a whole, rather than focusing on the more reactive individualized support? It takes everyone into account in a school when you're stepping back and really creating this culture of, of belonging. And yes, there are supports that need to be put in place, but I think even more important than that, we have to think about building a shared understanding of inclusion and of neurodiversity. This is more of a shift in mindset than a shift in practice. And so I, you know, I encourage schools and, and districts and classrooms alike to kind of step back and say, what are we doing really well in terms of creating an inclusive experience where, where everyone in this environment feels a sense of belonging? And, and where are our gaps? What are the opportunities? You know, what are the things that we could do differently to help all of our students be successful and raise the level of the ocean? Because again, and this is kind of where we started, you know, this is a what if moment. You know, what if every administrator and teacher and therapist and school professional and, and family member felt like they actually had the tools to better understand the neurodiversity that's inherent in their school environment and the tools and understanding to support their individual students who identify as neurodivergent. You know, I think that this paints, this paints a really wonderful picture and a wonderful um, vision and opportunity for where we can bring our schools in the next years to come. So I'll leave us with the, um, the artwork of a super spectrum girl, um, who came up with the idea of inclusion is the opportunity, right? Valuing difference, recognizing strengths and creating a space to enable each of us. So thank you again for this opportunity. I'm really excited to, to jump into the, into the Q and A. Um, again, uh, if you wanna learn more about the PINE program, this is our website um, and please feel free to reach out to me individually as well. So thank you very much. Um, Kelly, I'm gonna stop sharing my screen so that we can, we can all talk together, okay? Great, thank you. That was extremely informative and so powerful. Very, I found it very emotional. I just have to tell you, and I'm thinking there's probably quite a few people who are feeling the same way. Um, I, one of the, we had a, a, quite a few questions ahead of time. So if anyone has any, please type them in and we can get them, try to get those answered. Um, I'm not sure what we're doing on timing, but I think we've got plenty. Um, one of the first questions that came, that came through was, how is response to intervention or um, SRBI used to support inclusion? Absolutely, absolutely. Well, you know, we love our acronyms. So first of all, that's a, the perfect example of how, how we do love our acronyms in this, in this space. Um, you know, I think that um, any RTI framework, regardless of what, what a school or district is, is using, it kind of highlights that, that last piece we were talking about around UDL, right? And the idea is how can we pull back and move to, to more class-wide and universal supports rather than jumping to the more individualized support. And I think that, you know, as a, as a special educator, right, that's what, that's what my, my background is, you know, I was taught to hyper-focus on the individual challenge that, that a student kind of brings to the table, right? That's what we, we kind of oftentimes see as our superpower is, I can see exactly what this student needs in this moment. Now, that's all well and good, but when you have 25 students in a class, it's not possible to provide that kind of intensive individualized support, um, nor is it actually appropriate, right? Because that's not providing education in the least restrictive environment when everything is so hyper-focused and individualized. So instead, how can we take more of an RTI framework, back it up, provide a lot of these supports more at the, at the class-wide level, and then slowly, as we see, see students needing more individualized supports, provide those individualized supports and increase the intensity as needed. Great, thank you. Yeah. Another question that came through was, um, what studies or uh, data have you seen that show test scores have improved through including all students? You know, this, this has kind of been proven time and time again. There's wonderful work coming out of Syracuse University, for example, on, on really recognizing that 
not only do we see improved test scores in our students with, with IEPs when they're educated in inclusive um, classrooms, but we also see improved performance in their, in their general education peers as well. And I think that that's often the, the, the thing that's missed in conversations around inclusion is um, we tend to focus on what are the benefits for the students with IEPs. Um, and then that leads people to kind of wonder, but what about the, the general education? students, how do they benefit? Well, research shows that they actually benefit as well, both in terms of um, improved academic performance, but also in terms of um, social emotional goals. Like we see, we see a lot more resilience, we see a lot more um, uh, emotional regulation, um, we see an improvement in executive functioning skills, uh, and in the, you know, this, this, this data is, is actually coming out from, from New York City as well. We're going to be publishing that the, the test scores of our students who are autistic in, in, the, in the NEST program, um, actually, they did outperform some of their, their peers in, in other programs, but we also saw that matched in the general education students as well. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so another question. Um, to be successful in general education settings, do you need two teachers? You know, it's a it's a complicated question, but the the quick answer is no, you don't. Um, I think that there is incredible value to having two teachers in the classroom. I really do. Um, in mostly because you know the the collaboration that can happen and the differentiation that that's possible when you have two teachers especially two teachers with with different backgrounds i think is 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 wonderful but i don't think it's absolutely critical in order to provide um comprehensive education for for all students um you know i think one of the things that i'm really focused on this is the work that that, that we do in in my program is everyone needs to be trained because it could be that you have, maybe you do have more of a consultant model, so you have a special ed teacher pushing into to a gen ed classroom. And so at times you have two teachers in that classroom together. But if that general education teacher doesn't have the right training, doesn't have the right framework, hasn't thought that we need to build some of these supports into the, into the lesson planning and into the classroom environment, having the two teachers in there who aren't on the same page and who haven't collaborated together, right, that's not going to be great. Um, on, the, on the flip side, you know, I work with a lot of uh, smaller districts where having two teachers in the classroom is just not possible. They don't have the staffing and they don't have the students to support a model like that. But you can get really creative. How do you do station teaching with a, 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 a teacher in the classroom and a classroom aide and the SLP working with a number of the students in that classroom? You can do a station taught lesson that way. Um, it just involves planning in the same way it would you would need to plan with, with a co-teacher. So do I think that there's value and, and it can be an incredibly powerful um, learning environment when there are te two teachers? Absolutely. Do I think it is the only way that you can provide differentiated instruction and a, a, like a tailored classroom experience for a neurodiverse classroom? No, I don't, I don't. Um, but I do think that the training of everyone involved really is, is critical. Um, and that's true for whether or not you're talking about the classroom or the art room or the recess and lunchroom. You know, everyone needs the right tools so that you know how to understand and support the students that are in your space. Okay. Um, Does, that answer your, Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that, yes, I think Good. so. We've got a couple, we've got some more coming through, but here's one that a um, little bit longer question. Uh, my teachers say they already do inclusion. However, my child is not engaged in the classroom or with her peers in the classroom. Do you have any suggestions on how to convince them to take a new approach so she is collaborating with peers when they do breakout sessions. Okay, um, am I going to, am I, can I read between the lines that we're talking about a virtual environment? I would say yes. I'd say yes. So I think that, um, I think that inclusion has become a very gray word. Um, I think it's a really important word, but it, it can become a little bit nebulous. Um, you know, Paula Cluth even has a book, Don't We Already Do Inclusion? Um, so I think that this, this isn't at all uncommon. I think that in my mind, you are successfully, quote unquote, doing inclusion when students experience a sense of belonging 
and success and independence. So I think a question that, that I might ask is, what does success look like for, the, for this student? And it sounds like some of the priority is engagement rather than work completion, for example. So what would success look like and having a conversation between the between the family and, and between the teachers to say okay you know what are we really prioritizing here what is really important here and what would success look like and what's a reasonable next step to kind of work on that um, you know obviously ultimately we would love to see this student um, initiating with peers engaging with peers problem solving completing the work all of these things but oftentimes when we set that as the goal it's too much, it's too complicated. So kind of saying, yes, ultimately we'd like to see this, but at this point, what does social engagement look like for this student? Where is this student starting? And what's a reasonable next step for us to kind of focus on and how do we, how do we work on that? So um, you can think about a lot of things, who all is in that student's breakout room? How do we make sure this student is, is surrounded by, um, by peers that they feel comfortable with? Does this student have a comfortable system for communication, right? And even if this student is a student who, who is a verbal communicator, sometimes verbal communication in a breakout room, especially in a virtual environment, is actually incredibly demanding. So do we need to look at some alternative forms of communication just to kind of get them warmed up? Can we do something exploring the use of emojis? Can we do something exploring the use of, it depends on the, the age of the student, um, uh, a quick five point scale to kind of start. So if you're doing a response about a reading and they need to talk about what do they like about the reading, well, let's not start with your favorite part of the reading passage. Let's start with a five point scale. Did I number five hate it or number one love it? Where did you land? And so have the students kind of share a number rather than first sharing a full thought, which I think can be can be a little bit hard. So we could come up with a million different um, different strategies to kind of support. Um, but I think at, at the at the foundation, it really is establishing kind of shared goals between the between the family and the teacher and figuring out what's the reasonable next step and not just focusing on, well, did they do the work or did they not do the work? Okay, so um, the next question came through with a um, Q&A and it was, um, what are your thoughts on paraprofessionals assisting students in general classrooms? And do you think they are still needed if you wanna create inclusion and acceptance with typical peers? Another great question and a, comp and a complicated question. Complicated. I mean, what I'm gonna say is yes, but we need training. We need training. You know, paraprofessionals are oftentimes the least trained individuals working with the most vulnerable students, you know, and I think that that's that's really where where I want to I want to kind of focus because I think that you know, ultimately, if you have untrained people supporting uh, supporting two students in the classroom, it can lead to a lot of complications. And this is not the fault of the paraprofessionals at all. I myself was a paraprofessional when I started. Um, and I didn't get the same training and the same support as my, as my teaching colleagues. I also didn't have any time to plan with my teaching colleagues. So even the expertise that I did have about the students that I was supporting, I wasn't able to kind of communicate that to my, to my colleagues to help figure out how do you put these, these proactive supports in place. Now, yes, paraprofessionals and student, the, that, that adult kind of sitting right next to, to a student and, and supporting them or over supporting them can really compromise that student's ability to be fully included into a classroom. And I think that we really need to think about that. But I think that the solution can't be pull the para if that para is the one who's providing, who's doing that on the fly differentiation that's really needed for that student to be successful. I think rather than saying, yes, paras, no paras, I'd rather have the conversation about um, how do we make sure there's a shared understanding across the team and a real collaboration across the team in understanding the needs of this student and figuring out when and where and why and how do we support this student and having kind of a shared responsibility in that. Right. This one's a kind of a complicated one as well. Um, I open my pen for this one. Okay. Okay. Well, the, the child is high functioning autism. The teachers often say they're 
he's doing fine. Scores are average at grade level, um, but the parent feels the deficiencies are holding him back from excelling. Should I be happy with average or do, how do we help him reach the full potential? I mean, I know there's a lot of, not just yeah. one answer for that. Well, and I think that I would say that it's the same answer as if you have a typically developing student, right? Is I would say, you know, first of all, great. Great that this student is so successful and, and, and my hope is also feeling successful um, in their classroom. But I think that this is true for any student. We, we always wanna figure out what's the next step, right? What are the things that we really need to work on? And I think that especially with, with students who, who are on the spectrum and, and present kind of in this, this kind of high functioning, um, this high functioning manner, I think a lot of the things that can be challenging for, for students like this are a little bit harder to, to put, our, put our fingers on. So I would encourage I would encourage us to figure out what are some ways that we can actually go a little bit slower so that we can move faster down the road. I'd encourage um, families to kind of look at how is this student working independently? What are some of the executive functioning skills that maybe we can try to work on with this student, right? Can this student take on a little bit more independence around time management or planning and prioritization, things like that? Some of the things that um, may actually be a little bit challenging for this student, but you might not necessarily see it in terms of classroom work production. Um, similarly, some of, the, some of the nuanced work around um, reading comprehension and inferencing and writing for different audiences, right? Some of this, some of these, um, some of these kind of foundational skills can kind of be jumped over for some of our, our students on the spectrum, especially who are kind of high performing academically. So I'd wanna poke around a little bit there and see, are there any of these skills that we can kind of strengthen knowing that they're gonna be really critical um, moving forward. Okay, thank you for that one. Um, can you provide examples of how assistive technology can help students feel more included? Yeah, I mean, I think assistive technology in and of itself, right, it's a tool, right? It's a strategy that we can that we can use. So, you know, first of all, if we have students who who communicate using assistive technology, then finding ways to bring this to the forefront in our classrooms is really critical. Um, I'm working with a high school student right now who's non-speaking and, and he uses a device to communicate. And one of the things that he, he really complains about all the time is he's like, no one understands how to use my device. My device is this hidden thing that I keep near me. None of my peers know how to use it. Um, the teachers never model using my, my assistive device. Um, and so it's this kind of, it's this unknown thing that really makes me kind of othered in the classroom and means that his communication partner has to do all of the work to bridge the gap between his device and the rest of the classroom. So I think, um, first of all, if you have a student who's using a communication device, finding a way to, to bring that to um, the rest of the classroom and make that be a little bit more part of the whole class experience would be, would be really critical. Um, and I think in terms of um, other assistive technologies, the question is, what is it that you're trying to solve with this, with this device, right? If you, have, um, if you have a student who, for example, has a very hard time getting their thoughts out on paper, and so they do benefit from some sort of support, whether it be um, a person who is scribing or using um, some assistive tech to, to help do um, voice-to-text work, don't have just that one student using it. Let other students explore this too, so that it isn't just, oh, that's what he needs, that's what he needs, but it's not something that you need. Um, and I think that the same goes true for, for a lot of the, the supports that we see in the classroom. You know, I, I encourage a lot, of, a lot of schools to explore the use of a break area in a classroom, right? A space that any student can have access to if they need to regulate, if they need a break from, from what's happening that's a, that's a stressor in the environment where they can calm, recoup, and then rejoin the, the classroom. And, and what folks tend to say is, okay, well then the special ed students, they can use that, but my gen ed students are just going to misuse it. They're not allowed to use the break area. And I think that by doing that, again, you're othering some of the students in your class. We need to make sure that every strategy is open to every student and then have the conversation about what are the tools that help you be successful, right? I am not someone who needs a physical fidget in order to regulate. It's not something that really works for me, but 
I've used them, I've tried them, I've figured this out that it doesn't work for me, and now other people, you know, but other people can use it. So, you know, I think that having that conversation with a general education student in your class who you think is quote unquote misusing the break area, what I would just say to that student is, so how, how is using the break area going to help you? How is it going to help you complete work, feel regulated, feel calm, um, you know, prepare you for collaboration, whatever it is. Okay, so next time I see you use the break area, I'm going to see then that when you return after your two minute break, oh, I'm going to see that you begin your work faster. Great, awesome. I really look forward to seeing that. If the worst thing in the world is that you have a, a student using a tool that they don't necessarily need, but it leads to an increase in, in work completion or in following directions or engaging in the classroom, that's not the worst thing in the world. You know what I mean? Great, thank you for that one. We're gonna shift back to, there's another question that came through about the, the paras. Uh, many times the classroom teacher defers to the para. How do you get the classroom teacher who is really busy and needs to reach many different learners um, to also own the, that child or your child? I guess that's a hard yeah. one. It's a hard one, but it's a really important one because that's, I mean, that's yeah. the whole, that's the whole thing, right? And if we're going, you know, we have to create this, this shared ownership for our, our kids, right? Every student in your space, every student in your school is your kid. So it isn't someone else's responsibility to solve the problems or support your student, right? Even that is othering, right? It's kind of saying, I'm not the specialist. I don't really know what we're supposed to do. I need you to kind of figure this out. So is there a quick fix in the moment that I can say, hey, try this, try this quick strategy and this is going to work? No, I think a question I would really be curious about is, is there an opportunity for that paraprofessional and that teacher to sit down and plan together or talk together about this student's needs? Because this paraprofessional has undoubtedly figured out a lot of things that are really supportive of that student. Now that we know that, let's celebrate that and say, great, now we need to backfill. Now we need to figure out how do we build that into the lesson itself so that it's not this paraprofessional differentiating on the fly as, as papers are being kind of handed out. Um, that is a huge ask that I'm saying, and I don't say that lightly. This is a significant shift. And it's wildly complicated. And unfortunately, a lot of the, the solutions that I'm going to talk about, they're messy, but they involve more of a, a systems level shift in how we think about inclusion. Inclusion is not a place. Inclusion is not a specific program. Inclusion is not a, a specific um, adult to student ratio, right? Inclusion is a mindset. And if you have this inclusive mindset, then you realize that we have to find ways to kind of collaborate and work as a team to support all of our students. So I don't, I don't, I, if I had the quick, the quick fix and the quick solution there, I promise I would, I would, I would give it. But I think that communication and collaboration is, is kind of that without that, you're not going to get anywhere. And so finding, finding a way to kind of begin to pick away at that, I think would be really important. Great, thank you for that one. I know we're getting short on time. I think we're past our time. Was there, if, do you have time for another question or two? Oh yeah. Oh, where okay, am we'll, I going? We'll go with this one. This <laughs> one um, actually just came through and um, it's an important one uh, shifting a little bit, but any recommendations for high school and college level, level students um, and maybe even specifically ways that NYU supports independence and success? Yeah. Um, is huge. I think the, the biggest thing when we're talking about um, high school students, and even when we're talking about middle school students, and most definitely when we're getting into, into um, college age students, is talking about self-advocacy um, and really helping students begin to articulate and understand and own some of the things that help them be successful. Um, I think we need to be having um, students participating in their own IEP meetings starting very early and then as they get older, taking more ownership over those times um, and really advocating for their own needs. Um, you know, one of the things that, that we do at NYU, NYU does have um, an autism program for its undergraduate and graduate students. It's called the NYU Connections Program, which um, I'm an advisor for. And what we offer at NYU Connections is kind of a two-pronged support 
um, approach. Um, on one hand, we have weekly meetings with an advisor where um, every connection student meets with, with an advisor on an ongoing basis. And that is a time to help that student problem solve, troubleshoot, and figure out their best ways to, to self-advocate. It's not about compliance. It's not about um, specific supports that they need in, in the classroom, but kind of helping them figure out what do you need to do to be successful and how can we kind of help you get there. So I think providing that kind of support from a self-advocacy perspective is really important. And I think the other piece is if students are interested in becoming part of the larger autistic community or neurodiverse, a neurodiverse kind of community is finding opportunities for that. You know, for NYU Connection students, um, we have weekly meetings together um, and it's not led by me or by one of my colleagues. It really is just a space for students to connect around their shared uh, experiences being autistic college students. You know, what is it like? What are some of the things that are kind of coming up for them? What do they want to talk about? And I think kind of creating a, a sense of, of community and pride in, in their identity has been really important for them, or that's what we've been kind of hearing. That's and making great. sure that you have, a, look for colleges that have some sort of support, right? Look for colleges that have neurodiversity on their radar. Um, not as a remediation, but as something that they're proud of. Great, that is, that's great advice. Sir. Um, I don't know if, I think we should wrap it up. Being, any, do you wanna do one more or we wrap it up, Courtney? Your call, uh, guys. Yeah, do you have one more? Do you I have one more and I, I, it's, I think if, it's not gonna be a quick one, but maybe you could answer it quickly. How do you balance specialized services with the need to be in the classroom? I think that's challenging for so many. I know we're going back to you know the general classroom, but I didn't want to skip that one. You know, there's not a there's not a quick answer for this, but I think it's a really important question because there are some services that can be provided in the classroom, kind of in more of a push-in format. And there are some things that really it's better for the students, you know, you, they, it's, more, it's a more effective use of time to, to kind of do it in more of a pullout setting. I think one of the questions that I always ask um, families and, and schools is, let's look at the, at the current related services mandates. I think oftentimes, especially over the years, you kind of collect related services and they're very hard to let go of at times because you don't want to under support your students. But a question I always have is, are there any of the supports that are currently being met by a related service provider that actually could be brought into the classroom and worked on all of the time, right? So if you have a student who um, needs specific uh, regular sensory breaks, for example, well, one way to meet that is in, you know, twice a week OT in a group. Another thing is how do we bring all of those sensory, those sensory movements into the classroom so that they're implemented on a regular basis, actually across the whole classroom, perhaps facilitated by an OT, um, or perhaps that's something that can actually be, um, the teacher can be trained to do. And again, done on a consistent basis. So I think finding ways to kind of be a little bit more flexible when you can about how those services are, are um, delivered. But also I recognize the, you know, the, 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 special, the specialty services that specific related service providers can, can give. And if you are working on um, uh, proprioceptive input and eye tracking during your OT session, that's not necessarily something that's going to be able to be served in a, in a push-in setting. Um, but I think that we have to find a way to kind of break down this silo of it's either the gen ed classroom environment or it's magical related services down the hallway, right? How do we find a way to kind of talk about what are we working on? How do we generalize? How do we incorporate? And how do we find ways to um, minimize the unnecessary transitions that many of our students can, can kind of experience during their days? Great, thank you for that one. I, we um, went through most of our questions and I um, oh, won't keep you any longer. Anybody else on, on uh, Jamie or Courtney, or, um, even Trisha, have anything that I'm that you want to throw in there really quickly? Because I I know it's it's getting late and we're going to lose people pretty quickly. No, I think just what Lauren, we need to have you back in person 
Yes. I know. Thank you. I'm coming. I'm coming. You know, we had you scheduled for a year ago. It's glad that we're seeing you here on Zoom, but we definitely we look forward to having you back, hopefully in the very near future and seeing you in person. So thank you. This is so helpful, so informative. We really appreciate your time. It's, uh -oh. it's great. Well, thank yeah, you all so much for having to the me. To the library for um, setting this up for us, as well as the YWCA for helping um, get the word out and partnering with us. It's really, it, it's a, it's great. We can't do it without every, all these different partners. And thank you. This was wonderful. We could probably go on for a couple couple more hours, couldn't we? Another time. Anytime. Another I'm time. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank, thank you. you all so much. Oh. Bye-bye. Thank you.